Good afternoon. We will now be presenting our solution to this year's M3 challenge problem, defeating the digital divide. The problem we were tasked with addressing is threefold. First, we constructed a mathematical model to predict the cost of internet access in the US and UK over the next 10 years. In part two, we built a model for the bandwidth consumption per household based on the demographics given. Finally, in part three, we developed a model to optimize planning for cellular nodes in a specific region based on the region's demographics. Beginning with part one, we first strove to create a mathematical model to predict the cost of internet per unit bandwidth in the United States and United Kingdom over the next 10 years. To do this, we had to first separate internet sources into three main types, wired internet, such as cables, mobile internet, and satellite internet. Alex will now further discuss how we developed a model using these three main internet types. So what we did is we separately modeled all three of these internet types that at the end we took a simple average. We did this over a weighted average because we felt that it better represented the data. In a uh, practical application, a user will generally only be able to choose from one or two dictated by their particular use case. And so we felt that a weighted average by usage would simply misrepresent the data. Then we decided to model cost as inversely proportional to bandwidth. Um, this is for a few reasons. The first is that historically, as internet speeds increase, the cost per plan does not change. For example, a company's premium or entry level plan is likely to retain a similar price depending, um, independent of the uh, bandwidth offered. Additionally, demand and cost are not highly related. In early 2020, with the COVID-19 pandemic, internet usage was anywhere from 25 to 100%, but this was not correlated with an increase in price. Finally, competition is not a factor due to monopolization. Comcast and Charter alone account for 47 million consumers in the United States of America. We also assume that no novel technology will disrupt the market simply because we cannot predict this. So what's left for us to do is to model speed. And we did this with a logistic model. There's a few inherent advantages. The first is that it naturally showcases the relationship between internet bandwidth available to the consumer and infrastructure. A modeling infrastructure with a logistic curve is a well-known process. Uh, studies have modeled major US transport infrastructure, among others, as a logistic or relative to a ceiling. Um, and this has historically shown to be a very accurate model. It's able to it as well and give the additional advantage of a natural cap of one gigabit per second, which is roughly the limit of current technology. As you can see, it fits the data well. This is a graph generated by Matplotlib for US wired. And um, the R squared coefficient here was over 0.99, as is the case for both wired and satellite. Mobile has a slightly weaker correlation with an R squared of just over 0.8. And uh, this is due to the middle of the data, LTE was rolled out roughly in 2015. And this novel uh, technology caused a slight break in the data. So in table two, you could see our results. Um, internet is getting cheaper. Mobile is uh, decreasing the cost the fastest. Um, with the current mobile boom and prioritization of that technology, uh, we surmise that the infrastructure development is similarly prioritized. Satellite is by far the most expensive, but it is getting significantly cheaper. Um, and you can see this with, for example, uh, SpaceX's Starlink, which is rapidly developing that sector of the internet economy. But it is important to remember that while internet is getting significantly cheaper per unit bandwidth, uh, needs are not static and the consumer facing cost is likely not going to significantly change. We have a sensitivity analysis. Our model is largely resilient. Uh, the biggest case where it is not is with T0, the midpoint of the logistic, especially for satellite. Uh, this is due to a number of factors. First of all, our satellite data is slightly weaker, um, and it also spans a longer period of time, starting in the middle of the 90s as opposed to the late knots. Um, this also, combined with the exponential nature of our model, means that a slight perturbation in the input causes a large change in our output. However, by and large, this model is very resilient. We'll now move on to the next section. In part two, bit by bit, we were tasked with creating a mathematical model to predict the minimum bandwidth needed to meet 90% and 99% of a household's needs. This model was then applied to three households, a household with a couple in their early 30s and a three-year-old child, a retired woman in her 70s living with her two school-aged grandchildren whom she cares for twice a week, and three former M3 Challenge participants sharing an off-campus apartment while completing their undergraduate degrees and working part-time. To determine the average bandwidth necessary for each household, several factors were taken into account, including the household's income range, the amount of time individuals in each household spend on different activities, and the amount of megabits required per activity. 
To obtain the minimum bandwidth needed for each household to meet 90% and 99% of their needs, we created a normal model. Lacio will now further discuss how we implemented this normal model. So the first part of the model is determining the income range for a household, which basically involves finding the total income for the household and determining which of four income ranges it falls in. For the purpose of the given scenario where we were not given incomes, we use the average income based on the age and depending on whether the work was full-time or part-time. Once we have the income range, we use the average number of hours spent each week for the income range on each of seven activities, which are using a traditional TV, a TV connected game console, TV connected internet device, internet on a computer, total app or web on a smartphone, total app or web on a tablet, and school or work. We then divide the average number of hours spent by the expected number of hours across all income ranges, which was calculated using the averages and the percent of the population in each income range. This quotient will be referred to as the income factor. This value for each activity was then multiplied by the average number of hours based on age for that activity to determine the hours spent per week. So using the time spent in seconds on an activity, we can multiply by the bandwidth for the activity to find the total amount of data consumed for the activity. Summing up across all the activities, we find the total number of megabits consumed during a week. To determine the average bandwidth necessary, this number was divided by the approximate weekly activity duration of 302,400 seconds, which is half a week. As Hazem mentioned earlier, we describe the bandwidth using a Gaussian or normal distribution with the mean given by the average bandwidth computed. The assumption of a normal distribution arises from statistical multiplexing across different sources and traffic types and the use of a central limit approximation. So then in order to find a percentage of internet availability from the model, we needed the standard deviation, which is computed based on the standard deviations of bandwidth for each activity and fraction of time each activity is used. Since we are looking for 90% and 99% internet availability, the bandwidth requirement corresponds to the point at which the area under the distribution is 0.9 and 0.99 respectively. So here are our results for the average bandwidth and the bandwidth necessary at 90% and 99% internet availability. And you can see here how the different households compare. We then applied a sensitivity analysis, changing the income factor by plus or minus 10%. The small change in the bandwidth values shows that our model is quite robust. In part three, mobilizing mobile, we were tasked with creating a model to produce an optimal plan for distributing cellular nodes in a region and demonstrating our model's effectiveness on three hypothetical regions. Additionally, we were given preliminary data about three different types of cell towers that could be used to cover each region. In table seven, their features are outlined. Just to summarize, higher band cell towers can more easily meet the demand for internet with higher bandwidths and download speeds, but they have smaller ranges of coverage as a drawback. Based on that information, we designed an optimization problem. The optimal solution for a subregion would be a placement of low, medium, and high band cell towers that provide sufficient bandwidth to residents in the subregion while minimizing the total number of cellular towers. Translating these ideas into mathematical constraints, we developed a set of variables and inequalities to model the situation. Inputting these constraints into Python code, we used integer programming to optimize the sum of the number of low band, medium band, and high band cell towers, or n low plus n mid plus n high, as shown in red. For our first constraint, we determined the effective areas for each cell tower type, AI. We multiply those by the number of cell towers of each type in order to obtain the total area covered by the cell towers. This must be greater than or equal to A, the area of the entire subregion. Our second constraint follows a similar process, 
where the total bandwidth provided by one tower, BI, is multiplied by the amount of towers of that type. This is summed across the three cell tower, three cell tower types, resulting in a value that must be greater than or equal to the bandwidth requirement B of the subregion. Finally, our last constraint stems from the idea that the necessary bandwidth B of each subregion must be present in all parts of the subregion. Uh, so for each cell tower type, the effective area was multiplied by the bandwidth and the number of towers of that type. Summing this value again across all the tower types results in a quantity that must be greater than or equal to the area of the subregion multiplied by its requisite bandwidth. Within these three constraints, numerical values for the variable A and the variables BI were in the data provided. Uh, Dithya will now discuss how we calculated the effective areas AI and the necessary bandwidth B. So we were given data for the approximate maximum coverage radius for each type of cell tower, but the internet speed received will not be constant throughout this region. Thus, to find the effective coverage area, we use the cost HADA model, which can be used to find the path loss based on distance from the source. It is an extension of the urban HADA model, and it can be applied to suburban and rural areas. From the path loss, we determine the speed achieved through the Shannon-Hartley theorem, which determines the maximum rate at which information can be transmitted. We model the coverage area as the circle where the rate is at least in the middle of the range for the given speeds for each type of cell tower. The following shows the effective radius and coverage area of each type of cell tower from our model. We will now discuss how we determine the bandwidth required for each subregion. Based on our model of part two, we determined the bandwidth required for the median individual in each subregion from the age and income data provided. We then scaled this estimate by the number of people in each subregion to find the total bandwidth required per subregion. We inputted all of this data into a Python program and used integer programming. Here are the results. This is for region A. And next for region B, we see that none of the subregions require a midband tower. And this is likely because the regions are the subregions are much larger, and it is more effective to use a low band tower for greater coverage area and a high band tower for additional bandwidth. In region C, the subregions are much smaller, and this demonstrates why our model predicts no low band towers in almost all of the subregions. To summarize, in each part, we use real world data to model internet speed and bandwidth needs. In part one, we use logistic models to predict average internet speed for each type of internet source and model the cost as inversely related to the speed. It was projected that the cost will decrease significantly in the next 10 years. In part two, we modeled the required bandwidth by a normal distribution and created an aggregate bandwidth requirement based on income level. Former M3 challenge participants require the greatest bandwidth while a woman in her 70s with two grandchildren used the least bandwidth. In part three, we determined bandwidth requirements based on our part two model and effective coverage areas of each cell tower. We used integer programming to minimize the total number of cell towers based on bandwidth conditions. Overall, we believe all of our models can be applied to provide insight into the future of high-speed internet access. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much. Before we get started on questions, I just want to say, like, really nice job. Excellent. All right. And now we have questions from your panel of judges. Nice job. I'm going to start out with um, a question I have for your solution to question two. <clears throat> so a lot of it was based on these different ranges of income. I'm wondering how you came up with those values that you used. So we, um, so we use the age for um, each uh, person in the household. And based on the age, uh, we found values for um, the average income that they had, um, uh, that people of that age make. Um, we found that online. And we basically just took the sum of all those incomes. And it was also based on whether the work was 
full-time or part-time because people of a certain age would uh, make certain, um, different amounts if they worked uh, uh, full-time versus part-time. So then we just add, added the incomes together to determine the total income and um, that income would fall into um, one of four ranges. Right, so that's my question. Those four ranges that you used, how did you come up with those? Arbitrarily or uh, was the reason yeah. that you picked those income ranges? So the data that we were given from um, N3, uh, they had data for the average number of hours that um, people would uh, spend on an activity and it was grouped based on those four income ranges. So I believe the data was from the Nielsen Corporation um, one, um, from one of their reports. So we just decided to use those four income ranges since the report provided them. Okay, thanks. Again, great job. Um, I just have a question going back to the, um, your, your response to the first question. Um, when you looked at the cost, you took a simple average of the wired, mobile, and satellite. Uh, you said in the presentation that the data led you to just take a simple average and a weighted average was not appropriate. I was wondering if you could expand on that and explain uh, how you came to that conclusion. Uh, so sure. So we, we really do think that a weighted average is less representative metric here. In almost all cases, a user's needs are only satisfied by a specific type of internet. For example, if you're in a really remote area, you might need to use satellite without a choice. If you need to use something for a mobile application, well, you're only going to be able to use mobile. There is some overlap, for example, um, but generally, weighting by usage statistics, um, we think this is not appropriate. Um, in practicality, we reported in our paper um, the costs for all three internet types, and um, for any specific application, uh, a person would be interested in one of these. However, we still needed that overall metric. Uh, and so what we did is we did a simple average. We felt that if we used a weighted average, um, someone might be misled into thinking that this is truly representative of all types of internet, um, as opposed to a simple average, uh, which kind of combines the uh, three internet types in a way that uh, does not misrepresent the data. Right, but you also said that uh, this currently the satellite usage is not very extensive. So how does that um, how is that consistent with with that statement that you can just take a simple average? Uh, in truth, no single metric is sufficient um, because if you, satellite is not very extensive, but there are certain applications where satellite is the only internet type that will suffice. Um, we felt that it was better to draw a simple average and then clarify um, that no, this is not a perfect representation of the data, but there is no perfect representation of the data than to take a weighted average, um, in which case someone might be misled into thinking that no, this is, a, is perfectly representative of internet connectivity everywhere. Um, if in practice, someone wants to discount, for example, satellite data because they think it's not prevalent. Well, in our paper and in this presentation, we reported a wired and mobile like an average of those two, if that is the only data that uh, one is interested in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the constraints that you used in question three. Could you show us those again real quick? Okay, so I think I understand the first two, although if you would like briefly, like give me a, a rundown on those two. And then for the third one, I guess my question is, what are the cases that you worried about slipping through the cracks with the first two constraints that, that necessitated that third constraint? Does, that, does my question make sense to you? Like, why do we have to have the third constraint? Is there a case where there's some situation that would satisfy the first two, but not the third? I guess maybe that's my question. Yeah, so I can answer that. Uh, yeah, just to summarize again, the first two, um, the area of the cell, all the cell towers must be greater than the area of the, of the subregion. And for the second one, the uh, total bandwidth provided by the cell towers must be greater than the uh, bandwidth requirement of the subregion, which is pretty simple. Uh, for the uh, third constraint, we at first, we decided to only include the first two, but afterwards, uh, after some testing, we realized that, for instance, um, a low band tower could cover the area of a subregion, and a high band tower 
could cover the bandwidth uh, needed for the subregion if we just use the first tail uh, without necessarily distributing that necessary bandwidth throughout the region. So the third constraint kind of covers that possibility and ensures that the um, uh, cell towers can uh, provide bandwidth uh, to all parts of the region. Great, thanks. Um, okay, and now I don't know if there's other judges that wanna. Yeah, uh, am I on? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I like the use of energy programming. I haven't seen anybody else use that here. Uh, where do you, where did you learn about energy programming? Is that in the high school curriculum, or where, how did you know about that? Um, we actually did some uh, research when we were looking at the problem, and um, through our high school curriculum, we had previously heard of linear programming. And yeah. um, after some research, we saw that we could um, use a similar idea here when all of the um, numbers were supposed to be integers. And um, so we uh, found out about integer programming through our research and we decided to use that model. That, that's sophisticated stuff. So uh, good job there, guys. Um, last night at the Academy Awards, um, X Infinity announced that they are offering gigabit internet service. You said that's the limit of modern of modern technology. Uh, are those guys going to have any customers for um, gigabit gigabit internet? So yes, let me clarify. So what, the way we modeled internet speed is we modeled it as increasing uh, infrastructure will allow for increasing uh, bandwidth. So current infrastructure technologies means that we can provide, a company can provide gigabit internet to someone's home. Now, most people don't need gigabit internet right now, but bandwidth needs are constantly growing and someone heavily involved um, in the industry might. So right now, uh, there are a few locations in the country that offer gigabit internet. Um, however, as infrastructure grows, more places will offer gigabit internet, for example, um, and thus in our logistic, the average bandwidth will increase. Does, well, that's not my question. Does your model of usage from question two pr predict that anybody will need internet inter uh, gigabit ethernet? So gigabit internet, I mean. Uh, so none of the three scenarios that were uh, given to us require gigabit internet. Um, it is uh, presumable that um, at least in 2021 right now, a uh, gigabit internet will be used uh, by specialists. For example, somebody who has to run um, like constantly uh, running servers, for example, might gigabit internet might be very useful, I right? I agree. I agree. I, I got I I'll buy gigabit Ethernet if they offer it to me. But did you use the results from question two question two in question three? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Um to calculate the um bandwidth requirements for a subregion, uh we were given for every region the um incomes and ages, I believe, and we plugged in that into our model for part two to come up with the bandwidth requirements. But, but, but the max, the maximum in the maximum in your model is gigabit, which happens to be. So did you find anybody needing gigabit? Not for the provided data, no. Thank you. I, I love the integer programming. Good, good love to see that. Actually, I'd like to ask a question about that energy programming model. Um, so it, it, you treated subregions, you simplified them by focusing on the area and then we need to cover a certain amount of area. But so your model would, I think, wouldn't distinguish between say like a very oblong region and a round region, um, which might affect the number of towers you need to cover those regions. So I'm just wondering, given more time, uh, would it be possible to account for shape of the region in your part three model and how might you do that? Uh, 
Yeah, so as you said right now, um, we kind of just uh, assumed that each subregion was relatively small and that we could expect these cellular towers to be, be placed uniformly throughout. Uh, thus, more specific placement of cell towers would obviously depend on the shape of each subregion, uh, which we did not really take into consideration while developing our model. Uh, rather, uh, we focused it on the number and, number and type of each cell tower, uh, making an assumption that uh, those quantities only depended on the subregion's area and uh, action, and also its demographics. To add, um, if we were to improve our current model, um, one possibility would we could try to treat this as a circle packing problem into the um, like um, the given shape of the region that we were provided. Mm -hmm. And so if we had more time, we would definitely try to um, use the number of towers provided from our integer programming approach and try to um, pack the uh, circles into that region. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we probably have two minutes left, but I might ask just one more question. Um, what all did, did you find challenging about the challenge this year? Yeah. Yes, I'll start. Um, I, I think that the hardest part, I'm a, I'm a junior, this is my first time doing this, uh, was the challenge of uh, both coordinating remotely uh, but also knowing what to do, the hardest part of, of any modeling in, for M3, at least in my opinion, is you have a problem, um, but how to approach it is not obvious. And it's very easy. It was very easy to get bogged down um, into just spending lots of time, uh, like just running through possibilities and not making any meaningful progress along a specific approach. So that's personally what I thought was the hardest thing. Yeah, personally for me, I felt the... Um, 14 hour time constraint was one of the hardest parts of the challenge because um, like we could do endless research on these topics, but um, to, um, to create like a robust model within um, those 14 hours for each of the three parts and communicate it in a paper that was um, the most challenging part. I agree with Alex about what the most challenging part being uh, how to approach the problem itself. Like we could spend a lot of time uh, uh, thinking of many different models that we could apply to each question. But at the end of the day, we would have to go with one model and just try to generalize it to the whole question. I think the hardest part was um... I think once we had a model, like we had to translate that into, um, we had to figure out how we could explain it and um, put those thoughts down um, in the form of a paper. So it wasn't just like, oh, you, you come up with a model and that's it. It's now you have to figure out how you present it in a way that someone can understand. Think we heard from everybody? All right. Um, well, good answer. I, I was very I enjoyed those answers. Those were good 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 answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, clearly, the judges thought that you all did a good job with that writing piece and communication piece, and also with your modeling as well. Um, I just wanted to remind you that among the hundreds of teams that submitted you know, papers, you all are in the top six. So uh, we are highly impressed with your work and what you were able to accomplish in 14 hours is amazing. Um, with that, I think we're gonna close out this part and I look forward to seeing you again this afternoon. Thank you. Good job, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.